<coughs> it's great to see you all here. Let's invite the Lord's presence. Lord, without you we can't do anything. We can't even understand the simplest things. So be there our teacher, we pray. Amen. With your permission, a little review of where we went last time and then we'll move on from there. Some of you heard about Spike Milligan's death and one of his most famous statements was, you have to be a total idiot to be happy in this life. Now Spike Milligan would be right but for the Christian gospel. Because we're all growing old, there's death, we lose loved ones, life is marked by sorrow, pain, difficult things and tragedy. What's it all worth if it's only a bubble and death breaks the bubble. The biggest issue of the 21st century is the issue of meaning. Is life a bubble or is it an egg? Is it worthwhile fighting the battle? As you get older, you don't get bolder, you get weaker and the battle becomes stronger and worse. So we are trying to lay a foundation and last week we talked about how there's come a great change in the way many scientists regard the universe which is tremendously important because beginning with Copernicus and coming into the times of Darwin mankind had a diminishing ego in the sense that we seem less important. The world that was once thought of as central in the universe was very much a sideshow. And human beings, the product of chance. But there's been a great revolution in science and unfortunately it's mainly the scientists that know and many of them close their eyes to it. Others have become believers in God, not necessarily Christians. But great, great changes have taken place in science. I may have mentioned to you how a famous Nobel Prize winner, a Dr. Wald, wrote an article in Scientific American back in the 1950s saying, given enough time, anything's possible. And at that stage they thought that life itself was the result of chance. Some decades later the same magazine published a retraction and made it quite plain that no reputable scientific magazine in the world will now accept an article saying life began by chance. It's much too complex. Francis Crick, who's not a Christian, thinks it must have come from outer space, what they call panspermia. But that doesn't solve anything, does it? It just puts the problem a further step away. They're still left with the problem. Then I did tell you about the great meeting in Poland to commemorate the 500th birthday of Copernicus, where Brendan Carter gave a talk that changed the whole world of science. It was dealing with the anthropic coincidences that are popping up everywhere because in the last 10 to 20 years we've learnt more about the universe than all the previous millenniums of existence because of satellites and improved telescopes and cosmonauts. The universe is a different place and they have found some amazing things. When uh, I began to look into the topic, I was amazed how much there was. Here's a magazine, most of the articles are on this point. And I'll just read you one or two statements from it that I think you'll find of real interest. Here is one. 
talking about the constants of physics, the laws of physics. If they were to vary by a factor of 10 to the 41st, that's 10 with 40 additional zeros after it. A modest change in any of these constants would produce dramatic changes in the universe and render it unsuitable for life. Now, to understand that, you've got to think of a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth. If some things like electromagnetism, the power of gravity, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, if these differed by 10 with 40 noughts after it, and remember, all the grains of sand in the, in the world's seashores only amount to 10 with 25 noughts, and all the subatomic particles of the universe only amount to 10 with 80 noughts after it. So 10 with 40 noughts after it is a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth, and you can keep on going. And they have discovered that if the constants of physics varied by that much, there'd be no universe. There'd be none. The enormous usefulness of mathematics is something bordering on the mysterious. There's no rational explanation for it. The miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. Now, what that is saying is, how come the thought can grapple with the universe? There's a sense in which you and I are greater than the universe because we can think about it. It cannot think about us. Why is it that we have the capacity to handle numbers that can interpret the world out there? Einstein said the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Why should it be so? One more from this. If the ratio of strengths had been 10 to the 32nd instead of 10 to the 38th, this is talking about gravity now, stars would be a million times less massive and would burn a million times faster. In other words, everything would disintegrate in the universe. To illustrate it further, I remember decades ago going into the office of a scientist and seeing the double helix. You remember that uh, Watson and Crick discovered all about DNA in the lifetime of most of us. And that changed everything. Here's a book by Lauren Isley, a very great philosopher scientist, and he tells us what people thought about the human cell in the days of Charles Darwin. Listen to this. The cell consists of matter called protoplasm composed chiefly of carbon with an admixture of hydrogen, nitrogen and sulphur. These component parts, properly united, produce the soul and body of the animated world and suitably nursed to become man. With this single argument, the mystery of the universe is explained the deity annulled and a new era of infinite knowledge ushered in. And the author says, that's a very large order indeed. Now, in contrast to this idea of the cell, just protoplasm with carbon and a few other things, this is what they now know. This is by a man who's not a Christian. Michael Denton's Evolution, A Theory and Crisis, a very great book. Listen to what he says. To grasp the reality of life as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times, which they couldn't do in Darwin's time, until it's 20 kilometres in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design on the surface of the cell, every cell, we've got about a 300 trillion of them, we would see millions of openings, millions of openings in every cell surface, like the portholes of a vast spaceship. 
opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. If we were to enter one of these openings, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology, bewildering complexity, not just a blob of protoplasm, no. We would see endless, highly organised corridors branching in every direction, some leading to the central memory bank in the nucleus, others to assembly plants and processing units. The nucleus itself would be a vast spherical chamber, more than a kilometre in diameter, resembling a great geodesic dome, inside of which we would see all neatly stacked together in order to raise the miles of coiled chains of the DNA molecules. And remember, every DNA molecule contains approximately 4 billion bits of information. You know, Carl Sagan wrote the article on life in Encyclopedia Botanica. And in it he says, the information in a single cell, and there are about 5 million cells in a drop of blood, the information in a single cell is the equivalent to 100 million pages of Encyclopedia Britannica. 100 million pages, that much information. So it goes on to say, miles of coil chains of the DNA molecules, a huge range of products, raw materials would shuttle along all the manifold conduits in a highly ordered fashion to and from all the various assembly plants in the outer region of the cell. And then he says, nearly every feature of our own advanced machines has its analogue in the cell, artificial languages and their decoding systems, memory banks for information storage and retrieval, elegant control systems regulating the automated assembly of parts and components, error fail-safe and proofreading devices utilised for quality control, assembly processes involving the principle of prefabrication and modular construction. A typical cell contains about 10 million million atoms and so on. So we've come a long way from the blob of carbon. We now know that in every cell of our body there are analogues to all the inventions of mankind in their basic form. That's a tremendous discovery. If I wrote on the blackboard, this sentence arranged itself. No one would believe it, of course. But you see, the thing they've discovered about DNA is it's an information processing unit. And Bill Gates says the best computer we could ever come up with is not nearly as good as the computer in every cell of our bodies. So information, this sentence arranged itself? No. Information demands a mind. So today, atheism is scientifically passé. Its day is over. But people will still be atheists. Why? Because the main reason you and I hold on to lots of things is not because of the evidence, but for emotional reasons. That fits all sorts of things. Emotions guide us. So what does the atheist sign to say about this? He says, well, suppose there's an infinity of universes. It'd be like having an intricate lock, but having a trillion keys. One of them is sure to open it. But that's based on the idea that all things are possible given enough time, and that's not true. Only possible things are possible given enough time. Given enough time won't turn a flea into an elephant. It won't make six become seven. So that's the only way out that scientists have tried to find, that there's a trillion universe. There's no evidence for that scientifically. There is no evidence for any more than the known universe. But that's the only way out. So I say again, atheism is passe. You don't have to get into science. You only have to think of the miracle of thought. 
if you and I are the result of chance processes, thinking just the same as itching. The fact that we can think demands design and a designer. And once you get there, you have to say, well, if there's a creator, does he want to talk to us? In every earthly parent, there's a desire to talk to their children. What about the heavenly parent who gave us hearts and minds and affections? What about him? And there is one unique book which we call the Bible. And the study of it is called the study of theology. And two weeks ago we talked about its various divisions. Theology, the study of God himself, which involves the Trinity. Christology, the study of the second member of the Godhead. Pneumatology, the study of the third member of the Godhead. Anthropology, the study of the nature of man. And we mentioned last time that all of this stuff is tremendously practical. To understand what the Bible teaches about my human nature will make me very distrustful of myself in many areas and very careful in dealing with other people. Business, marriage, your whole life can be wrecked if you make a wrong judgment. Remember Reagan and Gorbachev, trust but verify. Because human nature is chameleon in its contexts, ever changing. And that's why the broken hearts, the broken lives, the broken families, Sometimes we're too optimistic. We forget that wherever there's human nature, there's deviance, there's error, and there's selfishness. And that leads to great tragedy. So all of these areas of Christology have practical importance. If we were to study Christology in more detail and read about the one who knew no sin, who was without sin, it brings a tremendous, tremendous relief, relief to us because we suddenly see that he was truly man whereas you and I are only shadows. He was like our first parents in the beginning without sin. But that's not true of me. And it's not true of you. If I make him altogether such a one as ourselves then I'm always discouraged because I can't do as well. But the New Testament Gospel says that Christ is first of all a saviour, only secondly an example, and then not an example in perfection or sinlessness, but an example in suffering patience and humility. Never set forth as an example in sinlessness. Sinlessness is not available to any human being in this life, though it should be our goal and our aim to get as close to it as possible. So all these divisions have practical meaning. We've talked about theology, and Christolo <coughs> Christology, pneumatology, anthropology. Then there's soteriology, which is the science of salvation. Here am I, ignorant, mortal, and sinful. How do I get out of that? Well, that's soteriology. And the Bible makes it very plain very simple, God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son whoever believeth in him should not perish so salvation comes by believing not by achieving because it's too late for any of us to win it by achieving we've blown too many things, we've made too many mistakes we could never hope to earn it so soteriology is all about grace the goodness of God he's better than we ever thought, though we're worse than we ever suspected. So that's soteriology about the grace of God, the love of God that woos the heart, breaks the heart. No one ever loves God, and that's the first commandment. No one ever loves God till convinced that God loves them. Then, after soteriology, you have to consider ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, the Bible says that the church is the body of Christ and the bride of Christ 
And of course, he's not a polygamist. He only has one bride. And it doesn't mean a denomination. It means all those who are twice born, all those who are trusting the virtues of Christ, whether they're Roman Catholic, whether they're Presbyterian, whatever. Once they have come to trust in the virtues of Christ, they're members of his church, whatever their outward name or sign. The Bible doesn't say Christ has 600 brides, 600 bodies. He has one bride, the church, composed of all who love him, whether it's Mother Teresa or some newborn into the fold of faith in darkest Africa. All the twice born make up the church. So that's ecclesiology. And that saves us from denominational antagonisms. And it also saves us from the error of confusing the church militant with the church triumphant. The church militant is the professed Christian body in the world. But it's a mixed bag. There's a lot of evil in the church. And Christ said that his church would be like a a field where good seed was sown and then tares. He said his church would be like a net that gathered all sorts of fish, good and bad. And not till judgment day would the separation be made. So the church is a hospital. Society is just a group of incurables and the church is not an art gallery but it's a hospital for incurables. And there are all sorts of problems in every church. And it always will be that way till Christ comes. So there's a difference between the church militant, which means the present professing church in its war against evil, and the church triumphant, which means the redeemed church when Christ returns. There is a difference. You don't know it, your heart may be broken. You're not to put your trust in yourself, your spouse, your business or your church in the same way you put your trust in God. He never fails. Everything else fails. Everything else fails. In the story of the prodigal son when it says, no man gave unto him. It's very important to understand no human being can fill the heart the most beautiful wife, the most handsome man, the richest friend, whatever ambitions you achieve, just as the sun could take a million earths and then 300,000 more, so the human heart is much bigger than anything the world can give it. Remember Christ said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water I shall give him shall never thirst. So when the prodigal son says no one gave unto him, it's reminding us, don't try to get from the creature what you can only get from the creator. Not even from the church. That's ecclesiology. And then finally eschatology, which we'll be moving into shortly. Right, the next thing we looked at briefly last week is why believe the Bible? And that's a huge subject, so we're only looking at one thing. The witness to and from Christ. He's the only person who's ever lived that claimed to be God and was thought to be sane. As C.S. Lewis says, anyone else that claims to be God, we think they're on a level with a poached egg, and rightly so. But Christ made tremendous claims. He claimed to have all authority in heaven and earth, Matthew 28. He claimed that all the angels were his, Matthew 16. He claimed power over nature, chapter 4 of Mark. He said people ought to love him more than their own lives, Luke chapter 14. He claimed to be the judge of all the world, John 5. He claimed to be able to forgive sins, Luke 7. Who is this man that claims to be the judge, the creator, the ruler of nature, and have all authority in heaven and earth? Then we looked at a few of his predictions. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. That is a very unique prediction. There's nothing like that in all of literature. 
here is someone saying in his own lifetime, my verity will never be exceeded, never be overthrown. It lasts as long as there's a heaven above and an earth beneath. And that's what's happened. You know, we've lived during the fall of communism. Who would have dreamt in 1970 that what could have happened to USSR has happened? Who could have dreamt that? We would never have thought that communism would have toppled in that way. And so today, instead of USSR, we have Russia and all these satellite states and communism among the best thinking people is dead as a dodo. But here's Christ saying, no one will ever throw, overthrow my teaching. And he made predictions like this, that at the end of the world, the gospel will go to all the world in one generation, at a time when there'll be worldwide wars and famines and earthquakes and pestilences, describing that generation, he said, and this gospel will go to all the world as a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And after his resurrection, Acts 1 and verse 8, you'll receive power, you'll become witnesses unto me in Judea, Samaria, and unto the ends of the earth. That's a magnificent prediction. He said, oh, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. He hasn't yet, that'll be judgment day. But what a great beginning. Two billion people, a third of the people on earth, claim to worship the crucified Galilean. He said, I am the light of the world, pointing to the sun. He has to be mad or bad or God to claim that he'd have the same influence morally, spiritually, intellectually on the human race as the SUN has physically. I am the light of the world. Then we ended last time by looking at the most outstanding prophecy in the Old Testament about our Lord. The last four verses of Isaiah 52 and the whole of chapter 53. You remember how it goes, my servant shall be exalted and very high and people will shut their mouths at him. What they would not heard before they shall now consider and he'll sprinkle many nations but his body will be more wounded and defiled than the bodies of other men. And when we'll see him, no beauty we should desire him. He'll grow up as a plant out of a dry ground. But he'll be the arm of the Lord, the messenger of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He is oppressed, brought as a sheep to the slaughter but he opened not his mouth. He's done no violence, neither was guile found in his mouth, but he's cut off out of the land of the living, but he shall prolong his days. This is Isaiah 53. Someone without sin would be cruelly murdered and he'd rise from the dead. Cut off. He'll prolong his days. And then it describes his last hours with the rich in his death in a rich man's tomb. He makes intercession with the transgressors for he's numbered with the transgressors. Put in the centre to show he is the worst of the three. And he made intercession for the transgressors. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Thousands upon thousands of people in every country have become Christians just by reading that chapter. It had been translated into Greek long, long before Christ was born in what was known as the Septuagint. It was spread throughout the whole ancient world in the synagogue system. No one can say it was written after the event. I've been to the Dome of the Rock in Israel, and some of you have. And there they show you those old manuscripts, far older than 2,000 years old, where that prophecy is to be found. I want to look at another one with you, Psalm 22, and if you have your Bibles, please look with me at this one. We have to be very sure... We can trust the Bible because some of the things we're going to study from Revelation will seem so astonishing. We want to know there's authority behind it. You know, the book of Revelation foretells the time 
when this world will threaten a worldwide Calvary. Now, when you go home, read chapter 11, read chapter 13, read chapter 17. Those chapters foretell a time when if you don't conform to the worldly governments and apostate religion, your life won't be worth anything. The book of Revelation predicts an attempted worldwide Calvary. The main thing you and I will get out of this class, I think, is this. The New Testament teaches very emphatically that the future is to be a replay of the last experiences of Christ. Over and over in the book of Revelation, it draws from Passion Week. You remember there was a triumphant entry when everyone hailed him as king. Then there was a polarisation and opposition congealed against him till finally the government, Pontius Pilate and co, and the church, Caiaphas and Sanhedrin, come together against the one who's just been hailed in the triumphant entry. Then he's betrayed. Then we see him on trial, six or seven trials before church and state. Three with Annas and Caiaphas, Sanhedrin, and then three with Pilate and Herod and back to Pilate. And then you have the cross event and the resurrection. Now, the book of Revelation constantly draws from those events to predict the future. And the book of Revelation is saying the future in its last days will be a worldwide Passion Week. Now that's a lot to swallow. That's why I'm so interested in sharing with you the reasons I see the Bible can be trusted. We're looking at Psalm 22. You recognise immediately the first verse. Graham, read to us a few of these verses, would you please? Beginning from verse 1, would you kindly read down to verse uh, the end of 8, would you please? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you, they trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and were not ashamed. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me, they shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him. Thank you, Graham. Would you also read 14 to 18, inclusive? I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a hot shirt, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. The dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and my clothing they cast lots. Thank you. And Graham, the last section now, verse 24 to the end, please. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard, My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. And all those 
to go down to the dust shall bow before him. Even he who cannot keep is soft alive. A posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. <coughs> Thank you, Graham. Please note it begins with the words of the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the last words are, He hath done, He hath wrought, He has accomplished, He has finished. So it begins and ends with the thoughts preeminent on the cross. And were you to read it in Hebrew, it reads like a psalm of sobs. Just one ejaculation and then a pause. And another brief ejaculation and a pause. It's a psalm of sobs. And having got down to about the middle of this psalm, having described his garments being cast lots for, uh, his hands and feet pierced, he can count his bones because they stand out. He's hanging in that abnormal position, so his bones hang out. So he says, I can count all my bones. And having got down to that cry in verse 20, deliver me, verse 21, save me, Then it changes. In the last verses, it tells us, verse 24, this offering has not been despised. He's not hid his face from him. Remember on the cross? My God, why have you separated yourself from me? Why have you forsaken me? Here it says he's not really hid his face from him. It seemed that way because Christ became a curse for us. He became sin for us. He bore our sins. God couldn't smile upon the prisoner at the bar. But now it says God didn't really hide his face. It just seemed that way to the one who represented all guilty mankind. So that's an allusion to the central saying on the cross. Remember there are seven. So you've got three sayings on the cross alluded to and that's the central one. Then it talks about praise in the great congregation. Verse 27, all the ends of the earth are going to remember this. All over the world. They're going to remember this. Why should they remember this suffering? All the families of the earth shall worship before him, it says in verse 27. Verse 29, everybody who dies has to bow before him. Judgment day. This sufferer will be the judge of all the world. Everybody who dies must one day bow before him. And then in the second last verse, A seed shall serve him, a posterity. He'll have followers. Men shall tell to coming generations and proclaim what he's wrought, what he's done, what he's finished. Now that's a psalm worthy of great attention. It's the psalm of the cross. The next psalm is the psalm of the crook. We know it well. The shepherd's crook, the 23rd psalm. And the one that follows that is the psalm of the crown. Lord, who will ascend into thy holy hill? So you have the great shepherd in death, uh, in, uh, in dying, 22, in death, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, 23, and then in resurrection, ascending to the holy mountain. Psalm of the cross, 22, the crook, 23, and the crown, glory, in chapter 24. So this psalm is marvellous. We're going to look at two or three other passages then we throw it open for any discussion. Would you turn to Haggai? This is towards the end, about the third last book of the Old Testament. At the end of the Old Testament you've got Malachi and before that you have Zechariah and then before that you've got Haggai. Very little, so tiny you can miss it. And we're going to look at uh, chapter 2. And please observe what it says from verse 6 on. Haggai chapter 2, beginning at verse 6 on. Rowan, would you like to read to us verse 6 down to uh, 9, please? Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 to 9.
Thank you. The setting of this prediction is the time of the rebuilding of the second temple after they've come out of Babylon and they've rebuilt it. But it's a disappointment. It's nothing like Solomon's temple. And the old people who remember the first temple, they all weep and they're discouraged. And God sends them this message that it's going to have a greater glory than the preceding temple. But there's one stumbling block here. Some of your Bibles read, the desire of all nations will come, and others read, as Rowan read, about the, uh, the splendid things or the glorious things of all nations will come. So let me talk to you about that first. It never ever happened that the glorious things of all nations came into the second temple. It never happened. That temple was destroyed one generation after the crucifixion of Jesus. So what can it mean? When it talks here about the glorious things or the desire of all nations shall come, the verb is plural, the subject is singular. So all the old versions translate it, the desire of all nations shall come. That's the way the Jews understood it, who first received the book. But more recent translators, seeing the verb is plural, have said, well, it must have a, while the subject is singular, it must have a plural meaning. So they have violated its singular nature, which hitherto had been translated the desire of all nations, the Messiah. Because the verb is plural, they've translated the singular subject as a plural. But it doesn't fit, because the glorious things never ever came from all nations in that second temple. It was despised and burnt down. So the old rendering is more accurate to translate it in harmony with the singular in the subject of the Hebrew and it should be translated as the Jews understood it for hundreds and hundreds of years. It meant the Messiah. It meant the desire of all nations. Why a plural verb? Because sometimes there were collective nouns or nouns of such great majesty that they emphasised their majesty by the plural verb. So here is one that would be God and man, the infinite one. So I suggest to you the old translation is the better for several reasons. One, it is a singular subject. You can't translate it plural as modern do. Secondly, it's not true the glorious things, plural, came into the second temple. It never happened. Three, the Jews who received this book understood it as singular and applying to the Messiah. And that is the better rendering in this case. The desire of all nations shall come and I'll fill this house with glory. What's it mean? The prophet is saying, don't be discouraged that this temple is not as good as Solomon's. It's going to have a privilege that Solomon's temple never had. The Messiah will come to this temple. And he did. He did. Rowan began by reading the promise saying, I will shake all nations. Before Christ came, there were these tremendous wars that broke up the Greek world. The Greek world is the world that Haggai is looking at. It's all broken up before Christ comes. The Romans come. Then into this temple which had lost the Shekinah, which had lost the ark, which had lost the special fire on the altar, which had lost the Urim and Thummim on the breastplate, into this temple that made people weep because it wasn't like the first one, came the Messiah. That's what filled it with glory. That's what filled it with glory. Look at uh, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi and chapter 3. And notice uh, the first verse. Guy, would you like to read us the first verse of Malachi 3? See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire will come, says the Almighty God. Thank you. So here's a promise of the Messiah coming to the temple. 
Now you're aware that in the Bible the number 40 is a symbol of trial and testing. Israel's 40 years in the wilderness. Christ is 40 days being tempted of the devil. 40 years after the cross, that temple was burnt down. Remember Christ said, not one stone will be left upon another. It won't be cast down. Before that temple was to be destroyed, the messenger of the covenant would come, the Messiah. And he'd have a, someone come before him, John the Baptist. What Guy read to us mentions two comings. I'll send my messenger to prepare the way, that's John the Baptist, and the Lord whom you seek, the Messiah, will suddenly come, even the messenger of the covenant. So observe, the Old Testament said the Messiah would come in the days of the second temple before it was destroyed. The temple has been destroyed. The people of the temple have been scattered to the whole earth. The present people in that land, the vast majority do not believe in the Old Testament. Israel has a cultural religion. Orthodox Judaism is very much the exception. Most modern day Jews are unbelievers. So the Messiah had to come in the days of that second temple the desire of all nations, and he did. Let's uh, ask, see if you have any questions. We should stop, please. Don't, you won't be embarrassed whatever you ask. If you think you're going to give a silly question, I may give a silly answer because I don't know the answer. So don't be embarrassed. Please, so Keith. You said before, if I be lifted up, that's right. Yes. So it's absolute fulfilment then. Yes, it begins its cross. And that's a very good statement, Keith, because the expression lifted up is used both for the physical lifting up on the cross and the lifting up to glory and adoration in the universe. It's used both ways. So that's an excellent question. It does begin at the cross, even though at the cross most people are jeering and denying. But even, at, even in the last hours of Christ, Christ had seven accusations against him and you'll find there are seven people around the cross that say he's innocent. One of them, a heathen governor's wife, have nothing to do with that just man, remember? Not the first wife to ask her husband an impossible thing. <laughs> It's impossible to have nothing to do with Christ. You've either got to accept him, reject him, neglect him. You can't have nothing to do with him. See? But she has six others. Remember Judas who betrays him. I have sinned that I betrayed innocent blood. Remember the thief on the cross. This man has done nothing amiss. The centurion says, truly this is the son of God. He sees him as sinless. And the text says, and the people that were with the centurion say the same thing. Pilate says, I find no fault in him. And he says that over and over again. Nor could Herod. So you find seven witnesses, the sinlessness of Christ. But Keith, even there at the cross, he's despised and rejected of men. Men of sorrows. But that's a very good point Keith has made. The lifting up begins on the cross. It reaches its consummation on judgment day. Please, don't hesitate. Your question may be that of someone else as well. I understand. Yeah. Jesus was questioning himself. A, would you comment on that? And B, are there any, what downsides do you see in believing that approach? The Christadelphians are a widespread religious group and many wonderful people among them, begun by a Dr. Thomas in the 19th century and it denies the reality of a personal devil. The view has not found widespread favour among Bible scholars. C.S. Lewis said a generation ago, the more you get involved in the fight against evil, the easier it is to believe in a personal devil. 
But the real reason people believe in the personal devil is because Christ apparently did. Christ could say, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. You do have these accounts of the temptation that Lester alluded to in Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4 uh, where the devil takes him, puts him on a high mount and so on and so forth. I'm sure there are elements of metaphor in those accounts. I'm sure of that. But it's a bit hard to get rid of the devil. The best statement I've ever seen on this topic may be worthy of consideration. It is just as hard to get rid of the biblical evidence for a personal God as it is to get rid of the biblical evidence for a personal devil. Uh, you find that in uh, McClintock and Strong's religious cyclopedia. And what they're saying is when you take Revelation 12 we have the great red dragon called the devil and Satan when you take Luke 10 I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven when you take passages like Ezekiel 28 which had a first application to the king of Tyre that transcends Tyre because it talks about one who was beautiful when he was created and the king of Tyre was never created. Uh, Isaiah 14 when you put all those together it is rather difficult to dismiss the idea of a personal devil and the main reason is because Christ seemed to believe in him but the whole Bible teaches it but it's held by many people I respect and you can make a case for it I just don't think the case is good enough it lessens our awareness of the depths of evil that we all fight if we are prepared to believe that there's a personal being who was once the wisest and the greatest in the retinue of heaven next to God then you sort of sense what you're up against and you sort of come to get a gleam of understanding of the most terrible things that are happening you know when Stalin took over Russia he put such pressure on the Russian people he caused a famine that killed 8 million people in the 1930s when Kirov, one of his right hand men in Leningrad was assassinated and some think Stalin did it because people would have liked to have had Kirov take over Russia he began a purge that wiped out five sixths of the leading men in all the military forces of Russia and the political circles wiped them out by the thousands and sometimes their families also the Russians have a great photograph of Stalin where he's holding up a little child. They never tell you that he murdered her parents. Now when you find a man who was responsible for at least 40 million deaths and some say 70 million, you think animals don't do that. Animals only kill to eat. You know, George Bernard Shaw they asked him once, we hear that you have a kindly dislike of human beings. Oh, he says, you're wrong. I have a craven, cowardly fear of human beings. He said, I don't uh, admire the lion tamer. He's safe in his cage. He's safe from human beings. <laughs> he says, no well-fed animal kills indiscriminately. Animals only kill when they have to eat, but human beings kill indiscriminately. I am cravenly afraid of human beings. So the question arises, why is there so much evil? I think I mentioned two weeks ago, during the Afghan war with Russia, the Russian soldiers would pour gasoline over women and children and set them alight in the villages throughout Afghanistan. Why? Because the children would creep up on wounded Russian soldiers and torture them with knives. Just recently in India, we've all heard about it. These pilgrims to a religious centre, mainly women and children, but not solely, have kerosene thrown into the carriages where they are and they're burnt to death. You know, it's hard to believe that human beings could do such things, but it becomes a little easier if there is a supernatural fountain of evil behind it all. Any other question before we take a break? Please. 
speak up quite loudly, I have seawater in my ears and the deafness of old age. <laughs> Isaiah 8.20 Yes It says to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word there is no light or no truth in them by the law and the testimony it means the Pentateuch the first five books you know when you read in the Bible it's written in the law that Abraham had two sons that's not in the Ten Commandments of Exodus 20 that's in the Pentateuch and the testimony means the testimony of the prophets so Isaiah is saying they're not in harmony with the scriptures don't give it any credit pardon would you like to expand that a little go ahead right yes Yes. But they may not have a, a complete grasp of the truth. Now, is there no light in it? Is that the context? It's probably true about truth as it is about goodness. Bobby Burns, there's so much bad in the best of us and so much good in the worst of us, it scarcely behoves any of us to find fault with the rest of us. <laughs> so it's probably also true of truth as it is about goodness, that it usually comes in gleams. There aren't any infallible people around. And the main problem in teaching is not teaching people to learn, it's teaching people to unlearn. See? But the scripture is trying to set a standard and saying, test everything by scripture. It's not saying that you can't distinguish in a presentation between what's good or bad, it's telling us how to distinguish, what part agrees with scripture. And may I point out, you can use scripture to prove anything. The devil quoted scripture. But Christ gave us the clue. He said it's written again. So it's when you find all that the Bible says on a topic, you have the truth. Not a single verse. You know, I know a verse that says, curse God and die. <laughs> there are two other verses that says there's no God. So when Christ answers the devil by saying it is written again he's saying to us get all that's written on the topic. See, I think that's our best safeguard. 